Welcome back to the channel. Today I want to do a deep dive into Air Flavor Pro. It is a plugin that was released for the standalone NPCs, and it is also available for VST and audio units. So I'd like to do a bit of a power user guide for this video. So hopefully by the end of it, you'll feel very confident to dig into the settings and tweak all the stuff that's available in Air Flavor Pro and not just rely on presets. The presets are good for sure, but in my opinion, uh, it's real flexibility opens up when you get into the details of each section. So let's get to it. And before we get started, a quick reminder, if you do want to support the channel, a like and subscribe goes a long way. And also using our affiliate links below helps out the channel. So even if you get cables or if you do plan on picking up a new NPC or anything like that, thank you very much. So for the sake of demonstration, I am going to be using a hardware NPC. This can work on any modern day NPC, you know, NPC Live, Live 2, X, XSE, Key 61, all that stuff. In front of me is the NPC One Plus, but it doesn't have to be. And I do have the plugin loaded onto the output one and two of the outputs here on the NPC. Normally I would not do that, but in this particular case, I have a couple tracks or four tracks set up for pad, kick snare, hats, and arp to do some demonstrations. So instead of copying the plugin over to each track, I figured a shortcut would be to just put it on the master outs so I can then affect the settings on there. But in a real production, I would not put it on the master out. I would put it on the individual tracks and adjust them accordingly. So I'm going to delete it and I'm going to load up a Air Flavor Pro plugin instance right here. When you first load it up, it loads the Akai ST1 preset. I'm going to take it off. What's currently playing that ARP is the Jura plugin, the work preset. Normally I would start with just that first preset and then tweak it from there, but I'm going to go into the init and then turn off all these modules. To begin with, we should talk about the master section. So there's an intensity knob that allows you to affect how intense the overall plugin effect is. Pretty obvious as intensity. Uh, there's a low pass and a high pass filter sweep right here, and they're very gentle filter sweeps. I find them extremely useful when I just need to shave off a bit of the high end, or maybe there's too much low end and some sort of thing because of the distortion added extra low end. So these are very useful for shaping your sound. And in a way, it can kind of double as just a regular high pass, low pass. If you do want to shape the sound source and also have some lo-fi magic. Then you also have a width setting and it goes from zero to 200%. So you can over widen it, that type of effect. Then you have a gain as well. And I think it goes up to six. Yeah, it goes up to six dB for makeup gain if you want. So let's go to the first module here, the pitch module. And again, I want to reiterate that everything I'm doing on the standalone version right here is the exact same and reflects the same as the plugin version. So if you're using the plugin version in whatever DAW, Logic Pro, Pro Tools, Ableton, all this will apply and it'll be the same. The reason I'm showing it on standalone is because I think it's really cool that a powerful lo-fi effect plugin is on the standalone version. So the way it works to get into each module is you have page tabs on the bottom. And the first one goes between the master page and the pitch page. That's how you can get to the pitch page right there. We're gonna turn on the pitch and let's listen to it with this. It's like a subtle effect. I'm gonna max out the pitch depth. So now it's very obvious, right? So something to keep in mind here is these knobs are effect amounts. They're not mix knobs. So if you want to blend uh, the original source with whatever effect that module is doing, you have to rely on the mix tab right here. So if I bring the mix all the way to zero, you're not hearing at all, obviously, right? So if you bring it up halfway, you're getting like almost a pseudo chorus effect. So let's max out the mix. I actually usually just keep the mix 100% on this stuff because I like to go for subtlety when I'm using this plugin. And also a quick note, this plugin is not for pristine quality. It obviously is taking a pristine recording and damaging it or degrading it. That's what the lo-fi effects do. So if you're looking for something to hi-fi your sound source, this is clearly not it. This is gonna make it sound more vibey or broken and damaged. So I'm gonna take the modulation depth. I'm gonna bring it down to around 30 to 40. This is what I think is the sweet spot for this particular module. So if you bring it to here, you still get a bit of the effect, but it's not obvious. Take it off. Put it back on. Nice and subtle. Now there's a vary parameter under each one of these modules distortion, digital, all that. And also if you go to the main page, you'll see very, it's a bit of a black box. It changes things depending on the module. And if you go to the manual, it just tells you depth of pitch modulation and other stuff. Like if you go to 
the timbre, depth, vary, amount of timbre variation. So it's kind of like, sure, it changes some stuff. I actually emailed Akai and asked, what does the vary sliders do in this plugin? And I got a response back. And in the case of the pitch, it does in fact just vary the modulation amount. What's unclear though, is whether or not it's tied to some sort of uh, LFO or something. Cause in a way it's like, this is technically varying the depth of the pitch modulation. So vary is doing the same thing, you know? A little strange on there. If I max out pitch and then increase vary, You can hear what it's actually doing is adjusting the fast and slow modulation. Yes, it's adjusting the uh, the depth of the modulation, the, the pitch modulation, but it's actually adjusting the fast and slow uh, LFO things that are going on in there as well. It's just you don't know exactly how much and particularly what values it's doing with the very things. My main criticism actually of this plugin is some of those things like very just seem like, what are they actually doing? Because I actually really like Airflavor Pro and that's why I'm doing a power user guide on it because I use it all the time. <laughs> the very sliders are kind of like, hmm? Anyways, I digress. I'm gonna put the very down to zero. So you have this rate slider and what it adjusts is the balance between fast and slow pitch modulation. That's what the manual says. If you have 100% fast, then the only modulation that's happening is this fast knob right here, which is currently at 1.12 Hertz. So let's play it. I'm gonna max out the pitch again. And then I'm gonna turn this up. So that's 20 hertz. So now I'm gonna change the rate to slow. Increase this to four hertz, all the way down to 0.10 hertz. So subtle. So the reason they give you a rate balance knob right here is because interesting pitch modulation or pitch modulation that would occur from say tape wouldn't technically be consistent on an LFO. It had these inconsistencies from the mechanics. So you can kind of simulate that. You could say it's mostly slow with a little bit of fast and then craft it or adjust it. So this is, let's bring the slow. Let's bring the fast down. Now let's bring the pitch down. So to push that even further into more mechanical randomness, you have this drift knob and the drift knob will basically allow the, the fast and slow modulation rate to drift in and out. So let's turn it up. Let's actually max it out like so. So we'll like slow down and speed up on both of the fast and slow rates, which is pretty cool. Finally, there's a stereo knob, and this is probably one of my favorite on here. It doesn't work for everything, but it creates like a pseudo chorus effect because it splits out the modulation into both channels. So they can kind of be independent of each other. So if you crank up stereo and listen to this. So they're not 100% independent, but they, it does seem like they're offset from each other, but it does give like a chorus stereo effect, which I really like. So we're gonna bring this back down. This would actually be a good time to show some drums on this because drums with the stereo is actually really fascinating. So off and on. The kick obviously gets smeared and blurred, so it's not exactly useful for the kick, but in terms of uh, hi-hats and other percussive type of things, having that stereo mix is actually really cool. So no stereo, 100% stereo. I'm gonna go back to the ARP that I have here. 
and we're going to move on to the X mod, the cross modulation type of stuff. This gets really heavy handed and the cross modulation, in my opinion, is one of the things that I don't use as much unless I really want to twist up a sound. So I'm going to keep the stereo at 70. Uh, we're going to turn down the pitch. So it's not super, super obvious. Now in the manual, Xmod says cross-modulate the dry and wet signal by multiplication or difference to create more intense modulation. So you can multiply the dry and the wet, and then you can also create a difference between the dry and the wet, depending on what you want to do here, and you can have an amount. So let's take the multiplication and start bringing it up. Really breaks it apart. Now let's go difference. Interesting, when you have 0% on cross mod and you go difference, there's an effect on the sound automatically. So, molt, difference. So, now I'm gonna bring up the uh, cross modulation. I'm gonna turn up the pitch. Go back to Molt. So like I said, you can really break the sound in these settings right here. And I actually find them very useful for percussive or hi-hat type of sounds. So let's just get the hi-hats here. That sounds really cool. Take it off. So now the, the hi-hats are very sharp, defined very like clean hi-hats with some reverb. You turn this on and suddenly it's almost like a shaker and a hi-hat type of sound combined. Now obviously you could dial it back. So I think that's really powerful for percussion. You can also mix in the original signal like so if it's too much. Let's put the kick and snare. I actually think it works out really well for snare drums. Snare drums I would add into like the overall mix, not necessarily your main snare, but like an additional supporting snare. Kick drum, you lose the edge and the sharp punch that happens in the low end from this, but it is an interesting effect for creating loops and maybe something that doesn't need to have like an obvious thud to it. So that's the pitch module. Very powerful. You can destroy your sounds or you can make some really interesting, nice tape wobble type of effects and also pseudo chorus effects as well because that stereo feature right there. Sometimes when I want a chorus effect but I don't want it to be super obvious, I'll actually rely on that and I've gotten good results out of that. Actually, one more example before we move on. We'll go to the pad sound that I have here. And this is without. And now we'll slowly bring in that pitch modulation. <laughs> so heavy handed. I'm going to take off the cross modulation. And now I'm going to take off the stereo. It's already pretty wide sounding, but stereo back on. Stereo off. Moving on to distortion. Now, admittedly, the distortion module is probably my least used module, but it is a very powerful distortion module type of thing. So if you look at this, you can go amp classic, amp heavy, tubes, transformer, vinyl, speaker, diode, synth, digital, a lot of distortion options right there. Let's talk about how this actually works. I'm going to make the mix maxed out. Uh, again, the main knob right here adjusts how much distortion effect happens. So if you want a little bit less distortion, you know, you turn down the knob or more distortion. It's not a mix value. The mix value is right here. So definitely keep that in mind. How much distortion versus the mix of the original signal and the uh, wet signal. Two different things right there. And the very slider adjusts the drive in case you're wondering. Okay, I'm gonna max out distortion right here. I'm also gonna take off pitch modulation. Okay. 
And we'll keep it on the pad because I think that's a good example. Now what you're hearing is nothing. Nothing is applied to the signal. And that's because you have input shapers to control what pieces of the audio actually get hit by the distortion unit. So right now I have a high pass filter that's going all the way up to 20,000 Hertz. And what that means is that anything below 20,000 gets thrown out of the effect signal. And same thing with the low pass, uh, anything above 20,000 gets taken away from the effect signal or the distortion signal. You also have this smooth low pass right here. And this is one of these things where it's like, what exactly does smooth do? <laughs> In the manual, it says center frequency of additional low pass filtering to smooth the input audio. When I read the input smooth on the manual, I was not exactly sure what that really meant. So I actually asked the Kai about it. 6 dB low pass filter on the wet audio. Lower smooth, lower cutoff frequency, no, inf no effect on the input. So what's happening is your input high pass and low pass filter tell what piece of the audio you want to actually get affected by the distortion. And then the smooth shaves off the too much of the high end. So if you're getting too much bright distortion, the smooth value is there to help control it. Let's actually bring our high pass all the way open and also bring the smooth all the way up. So now we're basically just getting all distortion from a transformer. And it sounds like it's distorting. Just the variation. Now, same thing. Let's just bring it down to say 30 or 40. Maybe more actually. Now this is one of these things that depends on volume as well. So if you hit this distortion unit harder, I'm sure it's gonna start distorting faster. It's depending on your input source, you know, that could affect the, the amount of distortion that you're gonna hear. Actually, we could go to the kick and snare. Yeah, so this distorts quicker. You can already hear it right there. Well, that's just the transformer model. Let's go to tubes. Tube breakup is very nice. Yeah. Bring in the original a bit. So let's max out the distortion for the drums here. And I'm gonna start messing with the high pass and low pass on here, because right now you can hear that there's too much uh, low end that's being affected by this. So what we can do is bring this up. And now if we don't want too much high end, we bring down the smooth. Or we could take the low pass and bring it down. Like so. No distortion. Distortion. Or we'll do it like this. Plug it off. Plug it on. Let's hear diodes. The input panel right here, very powerful for shaping your sound. Okay, I'm gonna turn off distortion. We're gonna move on to the next effect here, digital. Digital is where you're going to get your artifacting and uh, like glitches and stuff. So I'm gonna max out digital here. And actually I'm gonna bring the bits all up to 16 and bring the sample rate to 50K. So it shouldn't be doing much. Actually, actually I'll bring the smooth all the way up as well. So this should basically be nothing. Yeah, so we're not hearing anything. Now what I can do is start dropping the bits. So 
so it's like six bit. Already sounds cool. Now real quick on the very, in the manual, it says increase random variation of the digital effect, which doesn't really tell you much, right? So Akai told me that it varies the bits, rate, and stutter length. So there you go. If I increase the very, it's supposed to adjust the bits right there. Technically, it's only hitting the high end right here. If you look at the input values, these are different. It says uh, high pass is 10 kilohertz. So anything 10 kilohertz and above is getting the bits, bit reduction that's happening. And the low pass still goes up to 20,000. And I obviously put the smooth up to 20K. So you can hear that high end right there. But let's actually drop the high pass all the way down so everything is getting hit with a two bit reduction. Let's drop the smooth. Again, that smooth means that it's got a 6 dB roll off of the wet signal. So whatever has been affected by the digital processing rolls off the top end with the smooth. Let's bring this up to say 8 bit. Or actually could do 12 bit. Make it more obvious, we're gonna drop it down to like eight. Sample rate reduction is pretty straightforward. So the input shaping is where this is really powerful. Let's say we want to keep the low end and we want to tick off the high end, maybe five kilohertz. And then we'll take that smooth and bring that down as well. Here's without clean signal and then with more destroyed. This is where I'd typically bring this down to about 30 or 40 again, like a sweet spot. So you have a little bit in there, you know, a little bit of texture in the, uh, the tails, but you still have that original signal. Now moving to these last settings right here, you have glitch, length, envelope follower, and stereo. The glitch is like digital artifacts that happen in the signal. This can happen when like the, the bits get jumbled or something. Actually, I don't really know the exact science behind it, but I know there's artifacts that can happen when, with digital transfers, and this will simulate that. So if we turn glitch all the way up, and turn digital up. It's almost like an LFO volume dropout. Let's turn up the length. Now let's drop the length. Let's drop the stereo down. So now the glitch is mono. And then crank the stereo, start spreading it. Finally, you have this envelope follower right here. You can have the glitch effect follow the envelope shape of the input signal. So right now it's 100%, so we could just turn this down. So the glitch is just like consistent. You put up envelope, has a bit of dynamics in there. Generally, I like to keep this down and then turn the actual effect down. That's the digital right there. Moving on to vinyl. Future Tefty here, I decided to redo the vinyl section because I missed something in here and I figured it'd be easier just to completely redo it. So here we go. Uh, I actually just loaded up a hi-hat sound. So I'm just gonna be using this sound for this particular module right now. And something that I wanna point out right away is the release right here can actually go to infinity. So. Right now, if I turn up the vinyl and I hit the hi-hat, you'll now get some noise for infinity. Now let's turn up the crackle, which is a little more obvious right there. So that's tip number one. If you want to have a vinyl type of noise throughout your entire track, you can actually set up one drum program and just trigger something to then automatically have infinite noise going in the background, if that's something you desire. So I'm going to reset this. I'm gonna reduce the vinyl sound. I'm gonna get rid of noise, pops, clicks, and crackle. So everything's kind of reset. Also tone, we will bring this to zero. Stereo will drop down to zero as well. Envelope will keep at about 
and we'll keep it the infinite. So I'll bring up the vinyl effect to 100% and then I'll bring in some crackle so we can discuss this. Now, an interesting fact is that the rate knob controls the speed of the actual noise effects. So if you slow this down to 1%, you get a nice subtle crackle. You can even drop it down to zero and it stops. I actually didn't know this until uh, making this guide, which I thought was really interesting. So what you could do is technically automate the rate. I think you can actually, I haven't actually done an automation with that, but I believe you could automate the rate to kind of have it uh, slowly kick in like so. And maybe even like slow it down at some point. So it's kind of an interesting effect that you could do. Like I said, I haven't done that, but uh, that's pretty cool. So Crackle, pretty self-explanatory on these type of noise sounds. Crackle is actually my favorite because it has this nice crinkly type of thing going on. Um, I'm gonna turn that down. Then you have clicks. And clicks sound exactly like clicks. I don't use these too often because I don't actually want clicks and pops in my recordings. Here's pops. Yeah, if I heard that, I'd be like, uh-oh, my audio interface is glitching. I need to reset something. <laughs> so I typically don't use clicks or pops. Now there's rumble as well. And this also I don't really use because I feel like it's just a bit too much for the, the, the production. I usually filter this type of stuff out. But if you do want it, you know, if you want the rumble of like an actual vinyl deck in your noise to kind of simulate the stuff, you can do a pretty good job of that type of simulation and then have this control of the rate, which uh, it's pretty cool. Oh, I guess rumble stays in there with rate. Makes sense. Yeah, let's turn these down. Moving on to noise. Noise is pretty self-explanatory. It is noise and rate does affect it. So you can hear this. That's some pretty aggressive noise now, or it has some definite texture going in there. Let's drop it all the way down. 1%, nothing, nothing, you still have it in there. So again, uh, rumble and noise, the rate does not uh, drop it down to zero, but it does affect it. You know, that does sound different. Actually, let's check rumble real quick. Let's see if rumble gets affected. Yeah, you can definitely hear some differences in there. So the rate does affect all these, but 0% of the rate goes to crackle, clicks, and pops so far. Now let's check out hum. This is once again one of these things that I just don't really find useful for me because if I heard this in my recording, I'd be like, uh-oh, <laughs> I've, I've got a grounding issue. I need to go fix this. So typically I never add hum or rumble into it, but if you did want this, you got it. Let's see if the rate affects it. I don't think it would because it's a pretty consistent 60 hertz cycle or 50 hertz or something like that. So anyways, hum, pretty straightforward. So let's go back to crackle for these next demonstrations because I do like the crackle. You know, we'll put a little bit of noise in there as well. Maybe turn up the rate a bit. So. You have tone, stereo, envelope follower, and the release length. We already talked about the release length, that's why this is getting a continuous tone. But it is nice that you can set it to where if you just want a little bit... Oh, actually... Yeah? There we go, okay. So 100 milliseconds. It's definitely longer than 100 milliseconds. <laughs> I wonder if that's actually bugged. It's possible also because it's at 100% on the, the vinyl effect that you're getting more of a gradual drop off. So that that is something that could be happening as well. I'm actually gonna kick this back up to infinite so we can just listen to the noise while I talk about tone, stereo, and envelope. So tone is basically a high pass, low pass type of thing. If you bring it all the way up, you hear it gets brighter, more crispy. This is very useful where if you're filtering out the top end like this with the low pass filter of the overall plugin, it's nice to be able to adjust how bright this um, this noise is. So obviously that's as bright as it goes with the high pass being filtered down. But if you bring this down, 
you know, it gets even more kind of crunchy lo-fi, which is nice, while everything else in the mix is getting low-passed or getting affected by those filters. So I find this very useful. Obviously, it goes all the way down. So this is negative 100. Here's around zero. And there's 100%. Now, stereo broadens the stereo field for the noise. Actually, let's increase the noise right here. And then I'll drop this down. Once again, it's mono now. And then as I bring this up, it starts broadening. And then 100% stereo. So really nice to have this option right there. And I'm pretty sure that happens with the clicks and pops as well. Yeah, you can hear that they're stereo now. Now they're mono. And now they have a broader image. So really nice to be able to control that. I'm gonna drop those down, bring up the crackle again, bring up a bit of noise. Now envelope is interesting. I find that it might actually be a bit bugged in the software implementation because what it's supposed to do is with 100%, it's supposed to follow the input of the, the signal. So when it gets a hi-hat, it's, um, it's supposed to bring it in and it's actually working right here, but I've had other instances where like disappears with the signal. So this could be slightly bugged and you're definitely gonna have to use your ears to decide what is working for the signal. So with negative 100, you should technically lose the noise and then it comes back once the signal is gone. It kind of happens with this. You can hear it dip a bit, but it, it's not drastic like this. Like this, you're just getting a very, like a, a moment of noise and that's that. Um, so, you know, the extremes 100 and negative 100, I don't find those as useful. What I do find useful though, is anywhere from the 30 range to negative 30 range. Like around zero, you know, you're getting the full noise and it's not getting any kind of dynamics right there with the envelope follower. But around 20 or 30, there's a little bit in there. And I find that actually pretty pleasant. And sometimes I'll drop the stereo field maybe down to 50 and then the tone bring that down. Now you're getting a nice warm crackle. Lastly, there is the vary knob. I didn't talk about that yet. And it's one of these things again, where it says it varies stuff. Uh, not exactly descriptive in the manual. So Akai told me that it varies the depth, the rate and the tone. So that is very specific features that it varies. It doesn't vary the amount of crackle. It doesn't vary the clicks or pops or anything like that. It varies the depth of noise. It varies the rate and the tone when you move this slider right here. All right, moving on to the volume module. This will provide dropouts and also volume. So actually what happens with tape is you'll have these pockets on tape that will drop the volume. Sometimes it drops out just like a, a brief second. Sometimes you'll have pockets where it like dips gradually or obvious and then comes out of it and all that. So this will help simulate that. Same type of stuff. The depth here will tell you how much actual volume droppage is gonna happen. Uh, the very knob, what does that do? Amount of amplitude modulation variation, that's what the manual says. And Akai says, yeah, varies the depth. Pretty straightforward, just varies the amount of volume dropout that's happening. So I'll put vary down to zero. Uh, so same type of thing here, you have a fast and a slow with two settings right here. Fast goes all the way up to 30 hertz, and the slow goes to four hertz. The slow will also go all the way down to 0.10 hertz, and the fast will go down to four hertz right there. So if we bring the rate all the way over to fast, and let's put the drift of both these down. Let's put dropouts to zero. You play this, that's a 30 hertz. It's almost like a tremolo effect. Let's bring stereo down to zero. So what's interesting is stereo will create like that, that panning effect right there. And you could reduce it, bring it down to the middle or so. Again, this is maxed out. So what I would normally do, bring it down to 40 or so. Back to max. 
We're gonna keep the stereo down for this. So you have a fast and a slow, which means that you can have that same type of thing where it'll speed up really fast, then slow down and all that, and kind of create your own modulation kind of tapestry. So I'm gonna bring this all the way to slow. And as you can hear, very slow. Let's bring this up. Oops. Let's bring up drift for this. So drift does exactly what it sounds like. It drifts that, uh, right now it's 1.4 hertz. It drifts that up and down, almost like a like an LFO essentially that, could, that gets added to that on both of these. So drift for fast, do the same thing. Drift for slow, you get the idea. So if you bring this, you know, somewhere in the middle or so, also bring up the drift for the fast, it's something like this. The dropouts is like a full on momentary dropout. There's nothing in the manual that tells you what triggers a full dropout. And I don't know if it's tied to fast or slow. I guess we could increase these to see. Let's go fast. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if the dropouts are tied to fast and slow rates. So it's one of these things where it's like random full dropouts that come back. It's really short, obviously, because you can still hear the uh, the sound of the, the material that's coming through. So anyways, what I usually do, I like to keep the rate in the middle. I don't like to have a super fast fast. And the slow will probably be about one hertz or so. I do keep the drifts up. And the dropout usually is like 10% or lower. I actually do like the stereo effect. With that, that's what this sounds like. And then I usually bring the effect down so it's not distracting. Without. Nothing crazy with that one. Obviously you can make it crazy, but I don't find it as useful to have full on dropouts. If you do apply a reverb or delay afterwards, then that can be interesting to have those dropouts because it kind of like pops little pockets into the sound. But you know, you gotta experiment and see what you like. So moving on from there, we have the last one, timbre. Timbre is pretty straightforward. It's basically an EQ profile that gets applied to the entire band or the, the entire spectrum of the signal. There is no shaping on here. It's basically just a preset and that's that. Uh, you do have the amount that you get to add. And what's weird is there's a very thing on here. So this is one of these things where it's like, why well, even have a very slider? Cause it says it varies the amount of timbre variation. What exactly? Like, is it varying the actual profile? Let's go like speaker old one is actually a really good one. So without, oh, I forgot. I still have that on my bad. Put that back on. Speaker old two. Speaker old three. So let's turn up the very. I don't know if varies even do anything, honestly. Let's go studio large. I like this one a lot. Studio tiny. Earbuds new, earbuds old, a lot rolled off the bottom. Let's see if we can hear Vary on this. Not really. <laughs> oh well, I think it was a design thing. They wanted to have Vary slider on each one of these for a look, even though they're not exactly the most useful for some of the stuff. But anyways, back to the timbre. Typically what I like to do is roll from something like the studio stuff or the old speaker. Radio tube is really good. Radio tube two. Radio tube one. 
But again, bringing this effect amount somewhere in like the 30-40 range usually does plenty for the signal. In fact, I should bring in the drums for this. You know, I probably should have used the pad for the volume dropouts too. My apologies on that. So here's the, the radio without, with, speaker old, you get, yeah, you get that like, that 1K, 2K, 3K puncture or like piercing. And the studio large. You still end up losing that low end. And this is where I think if they had given you some shaping controls, you know, the high pass, low pass filter stuff, I think it would have been really useful for this, but they didn't. So anyways, I like to bring this down. Let's go to that pad. Let's put that volume on the pad. Yeah. This is way more obvious. You can hear that more clear. And actually, this is where I use the, the volume module a lot more often, is actual pad material, because you can hear the little pockets. Let's turn it all the way up. Clearly too much, right? Bring it down, 45, 50. Let's turn everything on. Let's bring down the low, low pass. Without. With. So again, this is all going into the master bus and I would not do that. I would actually take Air Flavor Pro into each one of these plugins or instruments and make my own settings for that instrument. And when I'm using drum programs, I go even further and sometimes I'll, I'll throw Air Flavor Pro on like a single hi-hat, do some of that uh, molting affecting of the pitch. And then the actual drum program itself, I'll throw an Air Flavor Pro on top of that. So I will stack Air Flavor Pro quite a bit on several things. And sometimes I'll put like a reverb or a delay before Air Flavor Pro, and sometimes I'll do it afterwards. Just kind of depends on the source. But I believe that covers it. Hopefully this guide has brightened your viewpoint on what you could do with the Air Flavor Pro. I have been having a lot of fun with it. It kind of boosted my interest just overall in using NPCs in general, knowing that I have this plugin available for anything, any sound source whatsoever that gets inside the MPC, or even Ableton Live, because like I said, we've been using it heavily ever since we got it. Awesome, thank you very much Akai for making an awesome plugin. Hopefully you found this tutorial useful, and if you did, a like and subscribe would be greatly appreciated. If you want more content about MPCs and music production in general, then definitely subscribe. And if you want to support the channel beyond that like and subscribe, using our affiliate links below through Zounds helps out the channel, even if you pick up cables, or if you do pick up an MPC or any gear or anything like that. We also have a Patreon, and we have sample packs available for the MPC on our website, so you can check that out in the description below. But that's it. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Thank you for making it to the end as well, and I'll see you next time for another one. Peace.